And as I started thinking about the topic that was given to me uh, or given to us to speak about tonight, which is why me? The question of why me or why is this happening to me? I started thinking about it and, and going over a couple of uh, thoughts that, that, that came up as I went over this question, because you hear this a lot. It's not just in English. You hear that in other languages as well. And I'm going to share an example of a text from 150 years ago where this exact question is, is, is mentioned. Why me? Why is this happening to me? And as I thought more about it, uh, two stories came up to me, and they both have to do with Hajj. And since we're in the season of Hajj, I want to begin with the story of Hajj and also end with a, the with a story of Hajj and hopefully have them relate in some way to us furthering our understanding of how to deal with this question of why me when it comes up in our hearts. So the first one is one that I heard from a dear friend and a fellow student of mine uh, in Mauritania. We were both studying at the Mahdara, the Madrasa of Murabat al-Hajj in the mountainous region, Taganit of Mauritania. And alhamdulillah, in addition to sitting with the shiuch, one of the biggest and best benefits is learning from your peers because you have discussions, you ask questions, they, have, they give pushback, there's arguments, sometimes friendly, sometimes not so friendly, but in the end result is that we're learning from each other, we're learning with each other, we're learning from each other, in addition to taking ilm, taking knowledge at the feet of these great scholars that we were blessed to, to sit with. So this friend of mine said that he had heard of a story of a man who converted to Islam. And after a number of years of being Muslim, or I shouldn't say a number of years, I don't know exactly how long he was Muslim, but after a certain amount of time, he was blessed to go to Hajj. And he went through all of the rites of Hajj, and then we know one of the last things that people do on Hajj is the days of Mina, where you're out there uh, stoning. And he went into a tent one day and saw everybody in the tent was lying on their right side, facing the Qibla, with their hand under their cheek, what does that sound like? They're following the sunnah, right, of the Prophet ﷺ in how he slept. Well, the interesting thing is he took one look at, at this row of his fellow uh, pilgrims, the other hujjaj that were there. He looked at all of them, and they were all sleeping in the same manner. And at that point, he decided to leave Islam. Whatever it was, that caught into his heart at that point, there was something, maybe something, we don't know exactly what was his thought process, but for him, that's, he was, one of the things was that, how are all of these people doing all of the same thing in the, all of the exact time? Like maybe he was thinking this is a, a cultish type thing. Whereas each of those individuals, they're all individually and sincerely trying to follow the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We don't know all that was going on in his mind, but we do know that there was an event. He had a belief about that event, and then he had a reaction to that event. That's kind of what I want us to take back from, take out of this um, time of, 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 of thinking about how do we respond or react to the question of why me? Now, another story, and I'm going to go back to this one as well, go back to both of them. In another story, it's actually the opposite. It's a, it's, it's, it has a happy ending. So there was, and this is a true story. This is not one of those pila wakalas, urban legends, something that just happens. I heard this from the man that this occurred to in London, in, in the UK. So he and a friend of his were having a meal and somebody knocked on the door and it was just a, a, a person, a Londoner, a fellow Londoner who had, who had his, he got lost. And this was of course the days before GPS when we could easily reroute ourselves. Um, he didn't know where, where to go, so he went on one of the doors and knocked on the door. Now, this is in the middle of London, and he's a just average uh, Britisher, Londoner. The person opens the door. The two people opening the door were wearing thobes and turbans. So that was his first shock. Like, I'm in the middle of London. It's nighttime, and the, the, who opens the door is a person wearing a thobe and a turban. So that was the first shock. He said, I'm lost. They started talking to him. And then they said, you know what? Come on in. Uh, it's, it's night. It's cold. Come on. We can uh, you know, take a break. So he accepted their invitation. He went inside. When he went into the room where they were having the meal, the second shock was that they were on the floor having their meal together from a single plate sitting on the floor. That was his second shock. And then his third shock was when they started to eat, they ate with their hands. When he saw them eating with their hands, and mind you, he, they have not told him anything about Islam 
or about La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah or about any of these beautiful, the meanings of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, any of these afkar of delivering the da'wah, the message of Islam, at that point he said, I want to be Muslim. So there was something that happened. He had some, some sort of belief about looking at that action and then he had a behavior that came out of that. So this is what is called the ABCs. There's an action, there's a belief, and then there's a consequence. And this is what we should be thinking about as that question comes up of why me? What happened? What's my belief about that action? And then what's what's the consequence? What's the, 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 the resulting action or something that I said? So he became Muslim, alhamdulillah, stayed Muslim. The, the, the more interesting part of the story is years later, he was in the, the United Arab Emirates and he was invited to a meal with a group of people and they were all sitting on a table and there was one person who was very, being very vocal about why it's so important to eat with forks and why the use of forks could actually supersede the, the sunnah of using the, the three fingers. And he started talking about germs underneath the fingernails and all of, you know, all of this, like downplaying the, 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 the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. After he gave this long speech, he turned to the man who converted in London and said, Brother, could you please share with us how you became Muslim? And he said, SubhanAllah, I became Muslim because I saw people eating with their hands. And I th thought to myself uh, after hearing that story that, you know, Allahu A'lam, but maybe it was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent, gave hidayah to that person just so that years later when some person is downplaying the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what might be the seemingly simple sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he could come to give victory to that, uh, nusra to that, saying, I became Muslim because of seeing, just merely merely witnessing that, that sunnah. So there's, there's an ABCs that happened to him, that the consequence was vastly different than what happened to the man on Hajj. So what happened? What's the difference? The difference is, in both of those situations, they had a, they had a, something happened that was out of their control, right? The person on Hajj, he wasn't controlling the way those people were sleeping. The person who got lost, he wasn't controlling that. So what happens to us in life, we can't control that. We cannot control that. But the next two things we can control. We can control our beliefs, our underlying beliefs about what's going on there, and we can control our reaction to those things. So as a simple example, you know, you get stuck in traffic. I think we've all had that situation where we get stuck in traffic, uh, we get late for a meeting, and then we're like, oh, and you get start getting frustrated at the, at the, at the stoplights, at the cars, at the trucks who are going slow, we get we have this frustration. And then if we ask ourselves, well, why are we getting frustrated? Well, because I gotta get to my appointment on time. And so if we dig deep, we can start saying, well, what, what is my belief? What is that belief? What is that aqidah, so to speak? Not aqidah in the sense of like theology, but what is my belief about how the way the world should work? What is my belief about how it should work that's causing me to be frustrated in this moment and then do something or say something or have a reaction. So that's the process of analyzing those ABCs. And when I was introduced to this concept, I thought to myself, well, as Muslims, one of the main things that we do in life is analyze our beliefs. We look and see what is our beliefs. We have a very, alhamdulillah, sophisticated system of understanding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, here's the, the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala behind us. We have 99 names that little children memorize and we learn that we study them. We, we study about the angels. We know about the akhirah. Like we have very detailed understanding of our theology. But in terms of applying that theology to our life, now, how does that come into our life? How does that Iman come into our life? How is it applied? That's what I'm talking about, that, that individual aqidah, so to speak, uh, that individual application or understanding of, of, of our belief. So when things occur, when things happen to us in life, then we have to, we look at our reactions. Look at how we're reacting to those situations. And then that situation could be a stepping stone up or it could be a slippery slope down into uh, an abyss, just a, a downward spiral of, of thoughts that start occurring to the person. Why me? Well, I, I deserve I deserve this. Well, I deserve this. And since I deserve this, that person should have given this to me and that I should deserve this. Now, what's the what's the what's the solution to that? The solution to that is to remember 
that as believers, we not only believe in the unseen, right? When we look at the Arkan al-Iman, think about the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam. It's a very seemingly simple hadith, but it gives us a foundation of understanding our deen. When Jibreel alayhi salam asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam about Iman, he mentioned six things. Belief in Allah, belief in the angels, the messengers, the books, and those are things we don't see. Well, we have the Quran with us. But the other things, the, the other elements are elements of the, the ghayb. And then what's the last one? The qadr. The qadr, we believe in the qadr. The interesting thing about the qadr is that this is almost where the belief joins the action. So if you look at the iman, the, the point of iman and the arkan of Islam, where the two of them join is in the shahada. They're mentioned in both things. You believe in Allah and the messengers. And then one of the, the pillars of Islam is the shahada. So that's the action, the statement that comes out of that belief. That's where the iman and the Islam join. And then another place where the iman and the Islam join in terms of being able to turn it into an action is qadr of Allah. So we don't just believe that Allah is in control of everything. We act like Allah is in control of everything. So we might, you might come to a person who's experiencing something or you yourself and we say to ourselves, why me? Why is this happening? Brother or sister or to yourself, don't you know this is from Allah? I know this is from Allah. I know that. Theologically, I know this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have complete faith in that. I'm just struggling in having my actions represent my aqidah, represent my belief. And so this is where the process of, it's not a belief in qadr issue. It's an action. And so um, depending on how much we have that belief in the qadr and that action and that acceptance of the qadr, that will tell us, that will show us how much, or, or that will tell us what, show us what our reaction will be. So for example, I've seen some of the most beautiful smiles and some of the heartiest of laughter come from people who are the poorest, literally living in tents with dirt floors. Where is that coming from? Whereas you find people living in luxurious homes with luxurious cars and they find it difficult to smile or laugh. Or if they do, it's not a sincere laughter. So what's the difference? Both of those situations, the people have actions that are coming, things that are happening to them that are outside of their control, whatever it might be. The difference is their belief in it, their acceptance. One person accepting the qadr and showing that I'm accepting of that qadr. Another person not having that same thing. And this also reminds us of another idea of whether something is a ni'mah or a niqmah. They're very similar in the words, the ni'mah and the niqmah. The ni'mah is a blessing, but it's a blessing that leads you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The niqmah is something that looks like a blessing, but it's actually taking you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that person on hajj, he had the quote unquote blessing of going to hajj, but for him in that situation, he turned it in, well, I, I shouldn't say it wasn't actually a nitma, but he turned that in to a, a uh, he made it for himself a, uh, a sort of a, a, a nitma. So, so how do we develop a resilience to the things that we face in life? So that when that question happens, maybe we don't say it, why me? But we might be thinking, why is this happening to me? One of the things that I wanted to share and it came to my mind as I was thinking about this topic is something I learned from a book called Matharat al The Purifier of the Hearts. And it's a book written about 150 years ago by a sheikh by the name of Sheikh Muhammad Maulud, rahimahullah, who looked at the learning system in Mauritania and he saw that there were gaps. And so he started writing books to fulfill those gaps. So they had extensive learning systems, but he said, mm, there's a few things missing. Well, one of the things that he noticed was that there was a lot of focus on certain areas of the ulum, but people were forgetting about the tradition of purifying the heart. Things that we find in the Quran, in the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he wrote this book. So it has the signs, the symptoms, the cures of over 30, of about 32 diseases of the heart. And each one of those diseases of the heart has an ayah or hadith to show us what, where, where is it coming from. When he gets to, and then he, he orders it alphabetically. When he gets to the section of qadr, of acceptance of qadr, he says, وَسَخَطُ الْقَدَرِ The disease of this resentment or this negative reaction to the qadr, 
the type of reaction that would cause a person to say, why me? Why is this happening to me? It's called sakhat ul-adr by some, as a technical terminology. Sakhat meaning anger. You're angry with the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's not that a person does not believe that it's from the qadr of Allah, but it's just that they're not acting as if they believe. It's, it's they're having sakhat wa qadr. So he says, وَسَخَطُ الْقَدَرِ أَنْ يَعْتَرِضَ عَلَيْهِ جَلَّ وَعَلَى فِي مَا قَضَى كَقَوْلِهِ مَا كُنْتُ أَسْتَحِقُّ ذَا وَأَيُّ ذَنْبٍ جَرَّ لِي هَذَا الْأَذَى He said, سَخَطُ الْقَدْرِ The definition is for a person to go against or have i'tirab of what Allah has ordained in a situation. What's a better word for i'tirab? Um, uh, like, what's that? Like a rejection. Well, what's the, another one that comes to mind? It, like just rejecting it, like having a, um, going against it, um, arguing with it, debating with it, with that qadr. And as an example, he gives two examples of what a person could say. He says, uh, I don't deserve this. Now he's writing this in Mauritania 150 years ago. How many people in this room have heard somebody now in America, in English, say, I don't deserve this? Raise your hand if you've ever heard somebody say that. I don't deserve this. The next thing he says is, What sin did I do to deserve this? Or what did I do to deserve this? How many people have heard people say that? What did I do to deserve this? And so those are two, two statements and anything similar to that, that if a person is saying them, it's essentially they're having, the, it's, they're showing this uh, uh, non-acceptance of the, of, of the adab. And I'll end with, uh, or uh, finish up with the statement of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And he says, he says, uh, very interesting. He says, أجمع سبعون رجل من التابعين وإمة المسلمين وإمة السلف. Seventy men from the tabi'een and the imams of the Muslims and the imams of the salaf وفقها الأمصار and the jurists of all the major cities على أن السنة التي توفى عليها رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم the sunnah like if when we talk about the sunnah like somebody says what's the sunnah you know sometimes people think and I you know, I'm, I in no way am uh, downgrading from a person using a miswak or doing some of the other outward sunnahs but sometimes we reduce the sunnahs to some specific rituals. He's saying the sunnah that the Prophet uh, died upon, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, awwaluha, the, the first element of the sunnah, al-rida bi qada'illah, being pleased with the qada of Allah, being pleased with the ordainment, with the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with taslimu li amrillah, and submitting to the, uh, to the, to the, mar- to the order of Allah, wa sabru tahta hukbihi, and having patience at that time, and then also uh, or, uh, taking what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered. So how do we get this? How do we get to have this taslimu li ridaillah? This is, that's a huge topic. We can't even scratch the surface and we're all still working on it. But a lot of it has to do with ilm, studying, having good tarbiyah, having good companionship. It doesn't always mean, you know, to develop this taslim la amrullah that we have to go back to the, uh, the, the scholars. Sometimes there might be issues when a person has a, like now a lot of people have pathways to doubt where they hear something about the sunnah, like the man looking at the people sleeping. It's clearly from the sunnah. We're not going to say, hey brother, that's wrong of them to do. We're going to say it's wrong for you to have that negative view of what they're doing. Or if somebody reads something about the, the age of Aisha anha, or some of the rules that are in the Quran, they read something. We're not going to compromise what's in our deen. But we're, what we're going to help that person understand is how do you accept that ordainment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that doesn't always necessarily come from a scholar. We go to the scholars to clarify what our deen is, but it could be a friend, a spouse, your children, community members. And that's why it's important to come to gatherings where we see each other. And it's important to have somebody to confide in. Um, so I'll end there and I'll thank you again. Uh, I know I was, gonna, I was gonna say there's another story about Hajj, but I don't have enough time to share that one. In short, if you wanna look it up, look up Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak and his story on Hajj and how he made Hajj without going to Hajj. Jazakumullah khairan wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.